We've been entering today into the spirit of celebrating freedom in all the music we've had, and on Tuesday we will celebrate the Independence Day of our, our great nation. We revel in the fact that as a nation we have freedom. And in singing our national anthem, we proudly conclude with the land of the free and the home of the brave. We have a long history which seems to verify this grand refrain. But things have been changing over the last few years. Actually, it seems that freedoms are ebbing away slowly. In fact, there's actually been a study by the Human Freedom Index, which every year rates the freedoms of countries, 159 countries all over the world. And sadly, uh, in 2008, the United States ranked 16th. By 2013, 19th. And by the last time the Freedom Index was printed a couple years ago, we were, had slipped to 23rd. But on the other hand, we get all the blessings from living in a great country of freedom. You and I as Christians and followers of Jesus have an even deeper measure of what true freedom really is. And that true freedom is a spiritual peace that comes from knowing and loving and following Jesus. We gather to worship each week because we believe in the truth of God's written word. We come here because we love Jesus. So we come to experience the blessing of knowing him even deeper. Now Jesus defined the source of real personal freedom in John 8:32, which was read. Jesus says, if you hold my teachings, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yet, and just a couple of verses later, when the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. That was his way of saying, wow, you really are free if you are at peace with me. Jesus, you see, was having an argument with the, uh, the religious leaders. They, they didn't realize that uh, they were slaves to their own selfish desires, and they didn't like what Jesus was saying. But Jesus, in his ministry, began to expand on this idea that he is the one who is all about what is true. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Later on, in John 18, at the time of his trial, when he was before Pilate, uh, he was being accused of things, and the, the people challenged him, saying he was king. And so Pilate asked him, indeed, if he was a king. And Jesus replied, you are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Notice those two points. His purpose was to testify of truth. And those who would accept truth are the ones who would listen to him. So Pilate asked him, well, what is truth? And that's a good question. We find in our culture today that truth is taking a major hit. It's in our secular society, truth seems to be relative and everybody decides for themselves what is truth. They have their own standards, their own beliefs. But Jesus very bluntly made it very clear that I am the truth. So what should our response be? First of all, Jesus said that we would know the truth. That word know means to hold on tight, to experience. In the, in the language of the Bible, it is the word used for intimacy. God wants us to have intimacy with him. And so he wants us to flourish by knowing him so that the truth of his life can bless us. And then he makes a second point that to say that it's more than just information, but it is to live the truth. 
The truth is just not something you know in your head. It's something you do. It's something you practice. It's something you apply. It's something you obey. It is something you follow. And it's more than just an intellectual thing. It is putting Jesus into your life and becoming a living representation of him. And, you know, over the past few weeks, we the pastors have been talking about how to make this happen, and it happens to die to self. When we die to self, we allow Jesus to come in, take over. Now, the dictionary defines truth as something that is verified or indisputable fact, a proposition or principle, or a state of character, of true being. The Bible only calls three things truth. The first one we just talked about, that Jesus himself declared that he was the truth. That is the first thing the Bible calls truth. The very person of Jesus becomes the clearest picture of what truth is in this world. And by faith, we can accept him. So Jesus is the essence and the personification of what truth is. Now, the second thing that the Bible calls truth, Jesus talked about just before his... Uh, his uh, crucifixion when he was praying in, in John 17 for his followers. And he said to God in that prayer, sanctify, which means set apart, sanctify them for your truth. Your word is truth. So God's word is called truth. This is something that Jesus wants us to know. The messages that he left, the teachings that he left, the, the inspired prophets and writers of the Bible are left for us to know the truth about him. In the Old Testament, the psalmist said the same thing. The entirety of your word is truth in Psalm 119, 160. So that second thing that is truth is the Bible. And over 200 times, the Bible tells us, uses the word truth to, to describe to us what God is trying to say. In the New Testament, Paul in Hebrews 4.10 affirms the same thing. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts, the attitudes of the heart. So the Bible teaches us that truth is a conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit as God is moving inside our lives. Sadly, in our country today, we find that the belief in Jesus, in his word, has taken a great slip. There is a group called the Barna Group, which studies things about Christianity and does surveys. And they came up on 2019 with this startling realization. They say biblical illiteracy in America, even among Christians who describe themselves as born again, is rampant. The state of American Christianity is revealed that in only 9% of the general population say they have a biblical worldview. And even amongst Christians, evangelical Christians who say they're born again, only 19% are actually practicing a biblical worldview. This is quite startling. So the second thing that the Bible calls truth is the word of God. Jesus, the purest revelation of God's life and character, the Bible where we learn about him. The third thing that the Bible calls truth is the law itself. In Psalm 119.42, your righteousness is righteousness forever. Your law is true. Now, when the Bible talks about law, it's talking about this, the, the law being the, light, the spirit life that God puts in us, not just a list of rules. It's talking about how God's spirit reveals 
his love in us. It is keeping the law of God is working out the principles of love for God and for your fellow man. So these things, three things the Bible calls truth. Jesus, the Bible, and the law, which is love at work. Jesus acknowledged when he met the woman, the Good Samaritan woman, that truth was very important. They talked about worship. She was comparing her worship to Jews' worship, but Jesus was saying to her in John 4, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father, notice this, the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is the one who is seeking us. He is longing to reveal himself to us that we can worship. Worship means to value him with all of our heart and mind and soul. And this is what God wants from us, to live a life of truth. Even the enemies of God recognize that he spoke truth when, when they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are true. And teach the way of God is truth. So God speaks through his Holy Spirit to us. He dwells within us to live out his life in us. Paul reminded Tim, Timothy, that it was important to practice this truth in 2 Timothy 2.15 when he said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the, or the word of truth. So there is a responsibility on our part to accept what God reveals to us, to analyze it, to test it, and experience it. So not, let's not miss the point that Jesus is making here. That having a spirit-filled life is absolutely what God is wanting to give us. He wants us to respond to the truth as is revealed about him in the life of Christ and in his, in his word that we might live a life of truth. You know, when Jesus was talking about the battle that we have between good and evil. In John 8, he goes on to say, beyond the scripture reading that we read today, he's talking about the devil. He said, he is a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it on his own resource, for he is a liar and the father of it. Notice what Jesus said about lies. Lies come from our own resource. Truth comes from God. You know, we easily can deceive ourselves, and we get deceived too in this world. It just simply happens. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it's talking about the great battle between good and evil at the end. And in John 12, 9, John is described, uses four descriptive words to describe the dragon, this enemy of the people. I'll read it. So the great dragon is cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, has cast, he has cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now notice, there are four words here that are just full of meaning that we need to understand what he's talking about. He called him that serpent of old. Well, where have we heard about the serpent in the Bible? That goes right back to Eden, Eden, where the serpent was lying to Eve. Then we find the second thing. He's called the devil. The word devil comes from the Greek word meaning diablos, means to slander, to falsely accuse. Then he's called Satan. Satan means adversary. And the fourth thing he says, he deceives, which means to mislead, delude, and lead astray. So let's take a look at what, Jesus, what the, the revelation of Jesus in, in, in Revelation says. That the one who is going to attack God's people at the end, he's a liar, a slanderer, a false accuser, an adversary of God and his people, and a deceiver. 
Now that's some powerful stuff. Right after that, in verse 17, the Bible says there was war in heaven. The word war means polemia. Polemia is the word for polemics, which means strong argumentation. So the war between good and evil is a war between truth and lies. Jesus is defined as the truth. Satan is defined as the liar. So what's important for you and I to know in our lives today, that there's a lot going on in our world that is that are lies, and those lies come from being self-centered, focusing on self rather than God's way. Now, how did Satan deceive in the beginning? Let's go back to, to Eve. First of all, he told her to question God's word. Then he lied to her about the consequences. Oh, you will not surely die. That's the way the devil works. He's a deceiver, a liar, and sometimes it even slips into the teachings of teachers, pastors, and Christian writers. And the Bible even says that in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 15. It says it will be false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder. Now, the next line is very important. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Angel means messenger. At some point in time, Satan himself will come claiming to be the savior of this world, to have a message that will set us uh, free from the problems that we have. How are we going to know what's truth? The Bible tells us to know Jesus and to trust his word. That is what keeps us safe. Sometimes we can even deceive ourselves because the Bible says that the human heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. But in James 1 to 2, it says, do not merely listen to the word and, to de and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. You see, even Satan believes what God says is true. He just doesn't follow it. So God wants us to not only hear what he has to say, but to apply it, take, take it in. Let Jesus come into our hearts and change us. It's the miracle of the gospel. That's why God Clint took responsibility for it when he said that we are his workmanship. He's knocking at the door of our life and wanting to come in, but we must invite him so that he can do the makeover. Other things that get in the way of 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 uh, accepting Jesus as us being not humble or thinking that we don't have any sin. Other things like uh, elevating our self-opinion too high. Galatians says, if anyone thinks he is something, then he is nothing. He deceives himself. And then another problem, instead of using God's standards to live by, we do what Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Rather. Do not deceive yourselves. If any man and one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's eyes. And as it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. God wants us to follow his ways and not our own. God wants us to use the standards of his word and not the standards of the world because there is great deception there. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, test everything, hold fast that which is good. 
there, because the Bible says there will even be false prophets among the people and, and destructive heresies. So God has called us to reverently, consciously test truth, test what is being said. The Bible also tells us that there will be demonic spirit, uh, spirits or influences that will be in this world. They will be ambassadors of Satan, deceiving men and women without regard for the truth that God wants to regenerate us. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, we excuse me, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 says, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That's not something that we really have a grasp on. But Jesus is calling us to trust him. We know that we're living in a world that has many tensions, many trials, many conflicting ideas. And what's happening in our world today is just the beginning of what's coming. The Bible makes it very clear that before Jesus returns, there is a lawless one, Second Thessalonians calls it the son of perdition. The son of perdition means the destroyer. And he's coming and he's going to show in Second Corinthians, excuse me, Second Thessalonians 9, starting uh, 2, 9 through 12. Coming of the lawless one according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Make no doubt about it. The Bible is very clear. The failure to love truth will lead to deception. The Bible says very clearly that Jesus, the Bible itself, and the spirit of God's law at work in us are what is true. We cannot live in a world by the standards of the world because they are not the truth. on the big scale of things in our world today. Can we see things that are happening that might indicate that this, these great deceptions are about to happen? The Bible does warn about the Antichrist, and we know there is one who will come, who will deceive. But the word anti means in place of. So any doctrine, any teaching, any lifestyle that is in the place of Jesus is a antichrist. The Bible says there are many antichrists, meaning anyone who is not living a life by faith in Jesus. So what's happening in the world today? We find people attempting to do good things without Jesus? Absolutely. In 2014, in Seoul, Korea, Every major religion in the world, and I mean every major religion in the world, with the exception of Protestant Christianity, met and signed a document agreeing on a one world religion. This is almost three years ago. They've been planning, they've been working together, they include Catholic, Jews, Muslim, Hindus, Buddhists, Zoroastrians, Shintoans, even American Indians. The only Protestant denomination there were the Anglicans. 
When the Pope came to the United States and spoke before Congress, he called for one thing. Hey, isn't unity a good thing? One world religion, one world government, one world financial system. But these are not based on having a heart change. They are based on political realities. Politics doesn't change people. That's why it has to be done by force. Only Jesus changes people. When the Spirit of God is in us, our lives are changed from the inside out. We can't do it by fiat, by law. Well, since that meeting in 2014, Protestants have been flocking to Rome. Uh, over, um, Kenneth Copeland went there representing over a thousand evangelicals, all agreeing that the idea of unity of religions is a good thing. And, you know, being divisive is not a good thing. But doing it by force or by doing it by political action is doing it without Christ, in place of Christ. In the past year, the Pope's made many statements saying that Jews, Muslims, and Christians all worship the same God. He said there's no such thing as a personal relationship with God. He said that the closest thing to Christianity is communism. Even people in his own church were furious about that. The top bishop in China strongly disagreed. He also said there is no salvation apart from confessing to a priest, and you are an illegitimate Christian if you do not confess to a priest. Now, is this what the Bible is teaching us? Not at all. Only we can come to Jesus is on a personal basis. Jesus didn't come to solve the political actions of the world. He came to save you and me and everyone who would believe. For whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is the good news. This is the real freedom that we have. We cannot do it by, by passing laws. On October 31 of this year, which is the exact day of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 500 years exactly when Martin Luther tacked those 95 theses on the door at Wittenberg. On that day, the worldwide Lutheran Church will repent of the Reformation and rejoin Rome. The documents were agreed upon in 2013. All the aspects of, of the Lutheran Church have, have okayed it, and they're announcing on that day and telling the world the Reformation is over. Only those who know and love Jesus Christ know that that isn't true. Because the Reformation was not a political action, it was about lives being changed by Jesus. It's about knowing him and serving him. All these things are contrary to God's plan. We live in a very interesting year. It all happens, happens to be a, ju a jubilee year. It happens to be the 70th anniversary of the state of Israel. And uh, there are a whole lot of things that might be very interesting to watch. But what's really, really important for you and I, is to know Jesus, to know his word. How many hours a day do we spend watching TV or playing with our iPhone? How many hours a day do we pray and study God's word? Oh, pastor, how can we spend hours? Well, wait a minute. Maybe we're living in a time where we better up the exposure to Jesus because things are beginning to change drastically. 
We're living in what the Bible calls the time of the end. You see, in Revelation 3, there is a very important text about the last day church. It's called Laodicea. And this is what God had to say about Laodicea. They think they are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That sounds like they're being deceived. They do not know that they are wretched and poor and miserable, blind and naked. Jesus offers a solution. God never leaves us in trouble. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I am with you always to the end of the world. Jesus wants us to know him and that the next few lines tell us how to have that change from being wretched and poor, miserable, blind and naked. And these things, by the way, were written to the church, not to the world. God is talking about his church here, not the sinners out there that don't know him. He says, buy from me gold tried in fire. See, gold tried in fire is the very character of Jesus that's been tested by faith to love him, to follow him. White garments, that's doing righteous acts. I salve to open blind eyes. That's the Holy Spirit coming in to show us how God wants us to live. So that's God's call to us today, folks. Let God do the work. Only he can do it. We all know that we can't do it on our own. Is there anybody here that wants to raise their hand and say, I've been excess successful without Jesus? It's not happening in my life. We desperately need God. We need to know Jesus. We need to spend time with him, accept the gift of his love, and let him come in. One of the saddest things about the last two churches, Laodicea and Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the only church that God doesn't scold. It's the church of brotherly love because they are living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in verity. But to the Laodicean church, he's standing on the outside, knocking at the door, wanting to come in. And only those who invite him in will have the gold, tried and fire, the white garments, and the ISAF. God will take care of it. This is the truth for tough times. Turn to Jesus. Let him know that you want to follow him because he's just waiting to come in. In Ephesians 6, excuse, yes, Ephesians 6, Paul is basically saying the same thing that Jesus did in his revelation to John. He said, brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might, in his might, notice it's his might, put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. Remember what that armor is? It's truth. It's righteousness. It's the good news that God has taken care of us. It's faith, meaning we're trusting him. It is salvation, which is the gift that Jesus gives us. So my call to you today, don't trust in man, not even yourself, for your salvation. Trust Jesus, because he's the truth. He wants to give you everything you need. I think of the hymn. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Jesus is the word made flesh. He and his word are one. Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. Let's celebrate the freedom that we have in him. Believe and accept and follow, and your life will be full and rich and free.